so moving on to our next speaker for the evening dr dinesh khanna ild troubles many in scleroderma life looks very bleak with lung condition fortunately there have been some breakthroughs in recent times dr khanna is based in usa michigan he is a rheumatologist who is doing a lot of work on ild he has an expert experience of over 30 plus years sir is here to talk about lung complications dr khanna directs a multidisciplinary group of caregivers scientists and clinical researchers dedicated to advancing knowledge about scleroderma and related conditions his research interest include clinical trials design in evaluating new treatments for scleroderma dr khanna is also funded by nih to develop new patient reported outcome measures in patients with scleroderma in addition he is leading international efforts to develop guidelines for management of scleroderma and gout so over to you dr khanna sir thank you and good good evening everybody uh, yes it is morning here and i got the time wrong so i apologize but thank you to dr bajani kashik bajani so i will talk a little bit about lung fibrosis and i don't think and i think dr pd that did a beautiful job i heard most of it on the different medications and most of those medications are also used in people with scleroderma and lung fibrosis so i think before we talk about lung fibrosis it's very important to understand that what is a normal function of the lung so we have two lungs everybody is well aware of that the, the right lung has three different lobes or part what we call upper lobe middle lobe and lower lobe and the left lung has upper lobe and lower lobe when you breathe in oxygen when you breathe in air i should say uh, it goes into this large tube called trachea and then it goes into these pipes uh, into into the two different parts of the lungs and as you start to divide them into more they start to become into what we call air sacs or alveoli so all these air sacs in our lungs are covered with this fine mesh fine network uh around those that are help you to breathe in oxygen so the oxygen comes from the lungs goes into the alveoli and diffuses into these fine capillaries that are covering the air sacs or the alveolus and this oxygen goes into your whole body and this way the carbon dioxide comes back back backs up as you see out here and it diffuses out and you breathe it out so that's how the lung you know one of the big parts of the lung is that you are breathing in air the oxygen is extracted out it goes from the large tubes into the small tubes into the alveoli it diffuses into your whole body system through this fine network of capillaries millions of capillaries that are covering your air sacs and then the oxygen uh, or the carbon dioxide is inhaled out when you look at the normal lung this is the left lung this is a you can see this is the upper lobe and this is the lower lobe of the lung and here are the tubes and you know we can't see it out here but there are many many millions of alveoli or air sacs that are captured as part of the lung on the left is a chest x ray uh, uh and you know uh, i'm sorry this is a ct of the chest and you know you tend to get quite a bit of that but or the hrct like we call it and this is a normal looking lung out here here's a heart that you see in the middle you see the one part of the lung and the second part of the lung and here's the diaphragm and here are all the fine capillaries or the blood vessels that i talked about you can see millions of blood vessels are uh, are going in into our lungs that are providing oxygen and taking out the bad uh, deoxygenated blood through through the exhalation of carbon dioxide so when there is fibrosis when there is lung fibrosis that is seen in 60 to 70% of people with scleroderma now here they are talking about ipf which is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis doesn't matter what it tends to do is it tends to cause fibrosis in between these alveolar sacs so you see a lot of fibrosis that is happening and due to that the alveolar capillaries or the air sacs that are very delicate part of the lungs start to break so you see it out here you know the lung out here appears normal but as you go down you see there are holes starting to occur you see big big damage that is happening to these air sacs and when these air sacs start to break 
the capillaries that are covering those air sacs start to break and it can impact over time your capacity to to keep the oxygen saturation at a level that you need so again you know this is what the lung fibrosis is and there are many causes of lung fibrosis but the most common cause and what we are talking about here is really related to scleroderma what you see out here is a patient of mine who had a ct of the chest and they have normal lung up here this is all normal but when you go down out here you start to see that they're developing what we call honeycombing uh, they're starting to break the part of the air sacs and therefore may have an impact on the overall lung function and also may have the impact on the oxygenation. So why do we worry about lung involvement in scleroderma? The two leading causes of death in people with scleroderma, including in people in India with scleroderma, I've seen a, quite a few of patients who come to US to see me and at other places, continues to be pulmonary fibrosis, also known as lung fibrosis, also known as interstitial lung disease, and pulmonary arterial hypertension. So this is a study from a city called Pittsburgh in US. And what you see is from 1970s to 2000, they have been looking at why do people die because of scleroderma. And what you see here is that pulmonary fibrosis, what we are talking today, and pulmonary hypertension were the two main causes of death. And still, when I look at my patients at Michigan, University of Michigan, they continue to be the leading cause of death out here. So in our patients, it about 70% of the patients who have lung fibrosis. Again, here's a patient of mine. This is a CT of the chest. Here's a heart in the middle. And you see the fibrosis, the scarring. Fibrosis is a, is a medical term for scarring and inflammation. And what you see is this is a normal looking lung. These are your normal capillaries or vessels that are going into the lung. And then what you see out here is quite a bit of scarring. So you start to see scarring out here. You start to see scarring out here with inflammation. And what Dr. Rath, P.D. Rath talked about was the medications. And the reason we give these medications, once you have a scar, where, whether it is in your skin, whether it's in your gut, whether it's in your heart, liver, kidneys, lungs, it's largely irreversible. So that's a very important point that I want to relate to, to, to people with scleroderma, that it takes a while before you start getting symptoms of shortness of breath. It takes a while before you start getting symptoms of cough. So therefore, you cannot wait for symptoms to occur before your doctors, your rheumatologists, your lung doctors look for lung fibrosis. Uh, it is largely irreversible, and Dr. Rudd did a beautiful job talking about different immunosuppressive therapies such as microphenolate, Temra, rituximab, and the antifibrotic therapy. So I will not take the time to talk about those. So there are two different kinds of scleroderma uh, or systemic sclerosis. One is called limited, which means a little bit of skin thickening, and one is called diffuse. So there are two different kinds of scleroderma people might have. But I think the important part, part of this slide is that lung fibrosis, also known as interstitial lung disease, occurs early in the disease. So if you're starting with scleroderma with Raynaud phenomenon, you're starting with thickening of the skin, you're starting with really significant heartburn, it is likely that you have lung fibrosis at that time. But unless and until a doctor looks into your lungs, to carefully look at it, you may not know, the doctor may not know till you start to develop symptoms. And for you to develop symptoms of shortness of breath, of cough, of feeling dizzy when you walk around, you have lost about 30% of your lungs. So that's why uh, it's an earlier complication. So if you have been recently diagnosed with scleroderma, and I will talk about the diagnosis of ILD, and if it has not been done, I strongly encourage you to think about it and do it. So this is again a, a study from Pittsburgh. And again, what it's trying to say is that most of the patients who had lung fibrosis had a decline in lung function in the first six years after onset of the disease. And when I see people in uh, from India uh, with scleroderma, most of the people have not had a CT of the chest or a lung function and another test. Now, I understand there are some challenges to do PFT or lung function in India, but this is when the decline happens. The decline happens usually 
in the first five to six years after onset of the disease. So your doctors, Dr. Bajani, Kaushik Bajani is on the call and there are other doctors. When you go and see your doctors, they do your blood test and what in, in the blood they capture something called autoantibodies. Uh, these, are, these are blood tests against the antigens or the proteins that all of us have, but in scleroderma, people can develop antibody against that. The most common auto anti antibodies, anti-nuclear antibody, 95% of people with scleroderma have it, but then there are certain scleroderma specific antibodies. And, and these are the, the most common ones that are done, the five of them I have listed out here, but the risk of developing significant lung fibrosis is depend upon your autoantibody. In India, this is very common. Uh, I worked with Dr. Vinita Shoba uh, and, and, and others in India, and this is really common in India, and Dr. Kaushik Bajani can talk more about it. The risk of ILD is very, very large if you have this antibody. So it's unfortunate, it's common in India based on your genetics, but if you have the anti-scleroderma 70 mm -hmm. or anti topoisomerase antibody, one and the same thing, the risk of lung fibrosis is quite large. And the type of scleroderma, majority of people are diffuse, although one third of the people in India who have this antibody have limited scleroderma. If you have centromere antibody, the risk of scleroderma lung fibrosis severe is small, so that is good. Uh, if you have something like RNA polymerase 3, which is very uncommon in India, the risk is medium. So this being very common in India uh, is associated with quite a bit of lung fibrosis, quite a bit of severe lung fibrosis that, that you know tend to happen in people in India with scleroderma. <clears throat> So now we'll talk about how to diagnose. So of course, the symptoms of lung fibrosis, if you're breaking all your air sacs is that you're feeling short of breath. When you're walking around, you have broken your air sacs, you breathe in air, the air is not going, the oxygen is not going through your body because the capillaries that are covering the air sacs have been destroyed, have been disrupted. And therefore, when you walk around or when you try to exercise, you get short of breath you start to cough a lot because there's irritation that is happening. You can do something called lung function test, we'll talk about, or there are certain imaging studies. So like I highlighted, you know, most of the time when you start to have symptoms, you have lost about 20 to 30% of your lung volume. And that is not good because there's no way once you have lung fibrosis, when you have broken your alveoli, once you have damaged your fine network, the meshwork of capillaries, you cannot make them, you cannot regenerate it. In, right now in medicine, we cannot regenerate, you know, these fine network and capillaries. The other challenge with shortness of breath may be that it may be due to pulmonary hypertension. I'm not talking about that or your heart involvement. It may be because of acid reflux. There's a lot of acid that is going into your lungs at night when you're sleeping flat and you're waking up coughing at night. It may be due to muscle involvement that you are short of breath and weak and heart involvement and pulmonary hypertension. So the symptoms are not very specific uh, for lung fibrosis and more importantly, they may not happen for months and months to a year or two years till the lung fibrosis has really progressed. I'm sure all of you have done a pulmonary function test. A pulmonary function test is really looking at your lung volume. So it looks at two different things. It looks at how much you can breathe in and out, how much air you can keep it in your lungs. And that is dependent upon your age, your gender, your height. Uh, so those are the three attributes that contribute to that. And what you do is the, the pulmonary function tech asks you to deep breathe in, 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 and then they ask you to breathe out as much as you can. So, so you know, this is what happens. And usually they want to make sure at least three out of the five or the three of the six tries that you're doing are highly, highly reliable or similar. When you do a pulmonary function test, you're sitting comfortably. There's a monitor here. There's a tech here that is pushing you to do pulmonary function tests. They put a nose clip, so nothing comes out of your nose, everything, and they put a mouthpiece. So anytime you go to a pulmonary function test, make sure that the mouthpiece is okay for a person with scleroderma because of uh, thinning of the lips and narrowing of the mouth. Sometimes the mouthpiece is too big to put in your mouth and if you do that the air tends to come out of here and the lung function may be uh, abnormally low because of the inaccuracy in doing the test 
So here are the different patterns that you see. It's not important for, but, but I just want to see what as rheumatologist and pulmonologist that we look at. Uh, most of the people who have scleroderma have this restrictive lung pattern shown here. So a normal lung function, you breathe in and you breathe out. And what happens is scleroderma, because of scarring of the skin, scarring of the lungs, you can see that instead of having this, they have a smaller. So they can't breathe in that much. And because you can't breathe in that much, you, can, you can't breathe in that much out. So this is a most common pattern that we see in scleroderma called restrictive lung disease. So PFTs are usually ordered by pulmonologists, although the rheumatologists are ordering. It can take between 30 to 90 mi minutes. It provides detailed information on your lung function. So here's a patient of mine doing a PFT. You see the nose clip here, and you see the mouthpiece going into the mouth. Now, one of the challenges of lung function is that the lung function can range between 80 to 120 percent. And this can cause confusion among patients and doctors. If you had a lung function of 120% where you started and today your lung function is 90%, it still is caught in the normal limits, but you have lost 30% of your lung function. And that is one of the key challenges. So therefore, as soon as you're diagnosed with scleroderma, you must get a lung function test to know what is your normal baseline, what's your baseline lung function. So as you are followed over time, by your doctors, there's a clarity about what's going on. Lung function can be normal in about one fourth of the patients with early ILD. So you're diagnosed with scleroderma, we do the CT of the chest, which what we call is gold standard, and it may be normal in 25%, in and that will give you false sense that, you know, I don't have lung fibrosis. So therefore, it is recommended now to do both lung function test and the CT of the chest. And again, like I said, it could be abnormal due to poor fit of the mouthpiece. So you have to make sure that the mouthpiece is appropriate. So here's a lung function test of, of my patient. And, you know, it, it gives you, just to show you, there are many, many, many values that are listed out here. Uh, the key things to look at is, you know, this is how much the actual post-vital capacity is. Breathe in deep, breathe out deep, about three liters. So this is in liters, 3,000 ml, and the, and the predicted for this person, for the age, gender, and height is 3.35 liters, so the predicted is 89%. So it looks normal, but this patient could have started at 120 ml, like I stated before. There are different values here. Uh, we can also do something called vital capacity, and then we look at this DLCO. The DLCO is a diffusion that I talked about. Remember, I talked about the air sacs, and then I talked about the capillaries that are around that and the, and, the, and the diffusion that happens of oxygen and carbon dioxide, that what it is capturing out here. So again, everything looks normal out here. And I just wanted to show you a, a, a picture of it, a snapshot of it. But when you look at the lung function, the doctors have to look at the previous lung functions to make sure that this lung function has not declined. So there has been an evolution in the management of scleroderma-related ILD. In 1990s, people used to look at chest X-ray. Uh, chest X-rays are usually normal in early lung fibrosis, and what you see is the haziness around the chest. You know, this is your heart in the middle. The heart seems to be a little bit dilated. And to start treatment, we used to want it to have abnormal lung function. You know, you had to add symptoms, and you had to add diffuse scleroderma than people used to treat. The evolution has become, we have started to do CTs and we have started to treat people even if the PFTs are normal, even if you don't have symptoms. Because once you have scarring of the lungs, it's likely to be progressive in people within in India because of this antibody I talked about, and we want to preserve your lung. Dr. P. D. Rath talked about the Actemra trial that I designed, uh, that the goal there was to preserve the lung rather than to try to stabilize the lung if the lung function has significantly declined. So the reason people or your doctors don't do CT of the chest is because of the risk of radiation. So one of the concerns that doctors have, the patients have, is that they say that we don't want to get the CAT scan of the chest or the CT of the chest because of the radiation. 
So I looked into this very carefully and I wanted to just talk about how much radiation do you get and why I think it's important to get at least one CT, uh, one or two CTs over the course of your lifetime. So if you live in any part of the world, you are exposed by radiation from the earth. You know, when you, when you live on the earth, there's radiation. There's a town in Kerala, I remember, where you get about 20, 20 units of radiation just because where the town is located in Kerala. But in U.S., if you live, the amount of radiation is about three units, millisievert, And it is considered that up to 50 millisievert or 50 units, we'll call it, of radiation is okay for people who, who are radiology techs who do the chest X's and everything. Now, when you do a chest radiograph, the amount of radiation is very, very small. But the challenge with the X-ray or the chest radiograph is it doesn't give you a lot of details of the lung fibrosis. The amount of radiation with the regular CT is about two to four units, similar to the amount of radiation, at least in US, that you get on annual basis. So you do get a little bit of radiation. It is much less than what is accepted as a normal or the upper limit of normal on an annual basis, every year basis in people with uh, who are who are occupational exposures with the radiation. So I just wanted to highlight to highlight for the patients here the amount of radiation that you may get. Again, like I highlighted before, that people might have early lung fibrosis uh, out here. You know, this doesn't seem much, but this is start of the disease. This doesn't seem much, and, you know, this may progress over time. And therefore, your doctors may choose not to treat you because if the lung fibrosis is that small, but they might keep a very close eye on you how things are moving forward. So the treatment of, of, you know, once your doctor decides that you are required treatment, you know, a part of it is really the education part. You know, the education, what is lung fibrosis? What are the expectations? What you need to do? What you don't need to do? Immunization, I cannot overstress. I think uh, Dr. Rudd talked about it, flu shot, pneumonia shot, COVID vaccines. He talked about the shingrix. Uh, I should have mentioned here the shingrix or the shingle shots. You should get all these vaccinations before you start any immunosuppressive therapy. Oxygen therapy. Your doctor will check your oxygen therapy, not on the fingers because of Raynaud's. They should be putting a band on your head and making you walk in the hallway to see whether your oxygen levels go down. And finally, the management of heartburn. Very, very important. When you have a lot of reflux or acid reflux or heartburn that is going on at night, you're aspirating. You may not know, but you're aspirating. And that acid is going into your lungs. And once that acid goes into your lungs, it causes inflammation. It is acid. You're pouring acid into your lungs. So therefore, every scleroderma patient should be sleeping at an angle. You should be sleeping at an angle and you should be raising the head side of your bed. You should be raising the head side of your bed, not by putting more pillows, but by putting bricks. So you can take the bricks that they used to construct and you should raise the head side of the bed. And you should have aggressive management with the doctors with the proton pump inhibitors. So again, like I talked about, if, you're, if you have lung fibrosis on the CT, your doctor determines whether you require pharmacological treatment or not. And, and if yes, then we treat with the immunosuppressive therapies and doctor PD that talked about all of those, and you also talked about the antifibrotic therapies. So here are the different therapies. He talked about cytoxin, mycophenolate, which is, um, I think, the most common therapy, uh, from what I understand from Dr. Kaushik Bajani and others. There's Ectemra, Tocilizumab, Rituximab, and Nintedinib, and he talked about perfenidone. He talked about stem cell transplantation, including CAR-T therapy. And then, of course, in rare cases, we tend to do lung transplantation. So I want to end with end my talk. Hopefully, you know, I have relayed that that earlier screening with the CT is really important. You may be asymptomatic. In other words, you don't have any symptoms, but you still have lung fibrosis. And for anything that's in, in, involving heart and lungs, because we can't live without our heart and lungs, we want to know early on whether scleroderma is affecting or not. Uh, there's a trial that we are doing in India. So if you're if you're a person with scleroderma, early scleroderma, and you have your lung fibrosis, Dr. Kaushik Bojani is one of the um, is is one of the investigators 
of this trial called Conquest, and I wanted to share a couple of slides on this trial. So this, this trial is looking at two different drugs simultaneously, two novel drugs that are not yet approved anywhere in the world compared to placebo. So every time we do a clinical trial, uh, and I think Dr. Bajani is going to talk about clinical trials after me, you are randomizing with a flip of coin to either an active drug or a placebo. Most of the trials, when you do it, you get either one-to-one -one randomization, one part of active drug or one part of the placebo. Here, there's two-to-one chance, two chances of getting real drug and one chance of getting the placebo. So you can see this is an international trial and India, India is listed here. And there are 165 sites worldwide. It's important to bring the trials to, to where I was born, India, because I want people in India to be able to, to have availability of these important medications that the rest of the world has. So if you have lung fibrosis, you know, you come into the trial and you're randomized to product A or product B. And because you're getting randomized simultaneously to either product A or product B, you know, the placebos are matched or put together. So, so, so you, there's two to one chance that you will get active drug and placebo and you're followed for 52 weeks and we look at your lung function test, your quality of life, what happens to your CT and, and, and other aspects. And like I said, uh, Dr. Kaushik Bajani um, and there are other doctors throughout India who are participating in this trial and we are very excited about it. So we will be recruiting uh, approximately 400 people with scleroderma and, and, and like I talked about, there are two different therapies that are, that are being used in this trial. So I will stop there. Uh, see, I, I don't think we are, we are taking any, any, any questions right now. I again want to show I had hidden, you know, and uh, another slide of my patient. So once you have scarring of the lungs like this, once you have the scarring of the lungs like this, it's almost impossible to reverse it. So don't just wait for the symptoms to occur. I know when we get lung fibrosis, we are scared. We don't want to know, but it's very important to know. Get your CT of the chest with small amount of radiation. It can really help you and your doctor to determine whether you have lung fibrosis or not. Once you have lung fibrosis, you don't need to do CT every year. We don't do that due to radiation risk, but we do lung function tests every four to six months after that till your lung function stabilizes. The medications are lifelong. The medications that I talked about are lifelong. You cannot take it for three to four months and stop it because if you do stop it, uh, the disease is likely to come back. So once you start these medications, you should be taking it and you should be careful combining it with Ayurvedic medications or, or other medications because we don't know how these medications will interact with each other. Let me stop sharing and see if there are any questions or anything else I can I can add here. So we are not taking questions for today. Nidesh? Okay. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, Dr. Khanna on behalf of our group. And thank you so much for a very informative session. Thank you for uh, shedding light on the technicalities as we often get to hear words like honeycombing and scarring. But today we got to know much more about it. And it will be definitely uh, quite helpful for us. Thank you for your important work you are doing in the field of IED for, as well. And uh, thank you for your valuable time, sir. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Okay, so... Nilesh, Nilesh, can I just interrupt yes. for a minute? There is a call from the ICU right now. And I'm okay. on the phone. So just give me two minutes offline before you... Uh, before I take on, right? I am on, on the call with the ICU doctor. Just two minutes. Okay, sir. Sure, sure. So maybe, Nilesh, I can answer a couple of questions. You know, I know we are not taking, but there are some questions. Uh, people are asking, and you know, Dr. P.D. Rath mm -hmm. is on, and Kaushik is on, how to manage mm -hmm. reflux. You know, reflux mm -hmm. is, there's a lot that has been written, and I know Dr. Kaushik Bajani mm -hmm. is going to talk about that. The other question by the, Ms. Sheetal is that can NSIP pattern change to UIP? Yes, NSIP pattern can change to UIP. Uh, it doesn't matter. It uh, There are different kinds of lung fibrosis. The key part is for UIP, like Dr. P.D. Duck talked about, we tend to give more antifibrotics. 
uh, but the patterns can change over time. Uh, Ms. Poonam says, beside PFT, any other lung test for lung because I did not have my PFT test. You should get a lung function test. Uh, they are available all over the place. And like I said, the CT of the chest, there's no other way to look at the lung function without doing the lung function test. So I just wanted to answer those three questions that were that were in the in the chat. Yeah, I think some you know patients have this problem, Dinesh. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so some people have this problem that you know they they are not able to perform the lung function test. So in that case, at least the CT and the six minute walk test should at least be done. Ideally, all three. But if not, if you're not able to perform the lung function test due to some reason. Uh, you must get the CT at least and get the uh, yeah, the six minute walk test at least. Yeah, you know the lung function test. You know even you know I do it every year because I'm the I'm the control here in the hospital. It, it it is hard because lung function test takes a lot of effort. I think people get used to it, and it's a lot about the technician uh, who is performing. Some people get claustrophobia because your nose is pinched and you have something in your mouth, and somebody's pushing you to push, push, push. Uh, but I do agree with you, Dr. Rath, that, that, you know, the CT and, and then and that would be helpful. My experience in seeing people from India and some of the people when I come to India to visit home is that most of the lung fibrosis, and, and, and you might advise me, is usually pretty moderate to severe. It's very rare to see very early ILD. And, and I think my request to the patients here is that once they develop scleroderma, they should be getting the CTs and not waiting for the symptoms to occur because it may be too late. Yes, absolutely. This is what you've been stressing all through, that you don't wait for the damage to happen. I mean, once it's done, it's irreversible, so we must pick it up before the damage happens. Yeah. I mean, any other questions we could take? In the meanwhile, I think Kaushik is slightly busy with the patient. You know, you, you talked about different medications, and I absolutely agree the importance of vaccinations. Um, there, are, there are many, many times that we see people develop severe zoster, uh, you know, uh, infections in their eyes and everything. So it's very important. Yes. I can't overstress the need for vaccination. In India, even more so, because in India, I think, you know, we are mainly dealing and struggling with infections. And it's infection which is a major threat to our continuation of treatment in most of our patients. So I think the flu shots, the pneumonia shots must be taken without any hesitancy. Uh, and Shingrix, where and when you can, you must take it because I think these are the basics. And plus there are some tablets which are given often to prevent certain kind of fungal infections, parasitic infections. So those things are also done uh, and those things must be adhered to. That's very important. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the other, other complication is tuberculosis. Yes, that's the other. Sorry, sorry about that. I had an uh, I had a call from the ICU for an emergency admission. 